and welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. All right, well, today we are in Ecclesiastes, and I've given it the really depressing title, Everything is Meaningless, because that is basically what Solomon says over and over and over again, that everything is meaningless. Now, I will tell you that my conclusion on Ecclesiastes is different than other people, and I I welcome uh, you to come and show me what I'm missing, what I'm wrong on, because I could very well be wrong on this, but let's just look at the basics of it. We can't look at all 12 chapters today, but we will look at a couple of chapters that will hopefully help you to see a little bit of what he has to say. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Solomon says this, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So if something is vain, if something is vanity, it is worthless. And so vanity of vanities, this is the most vain of all the vain things, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity, everything is vain. And that's just how he feels about it. And he says this, what does man gain by all the toil for which he toils under the sun? All the work that he does, what's the point of it? A generation goes and another generation comes, but the earth remains. The sun rises, the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it sets. The wind blows to the south, goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind and on its circuit, the wind returns. All the streams run to the sea, but the sea doesn't get full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things, so basically he says, everything just keeps going on and on and on. But one generation of man comes and then a man dies. So that's the thing, that man is temporary. A generation goes, another generation comes, and then the earth stays. And everything else keeps going. And the wind and the waves and the sea, all of that keeps happening. All things, look at his, his I don't know, he's depressed. This guy needs some sort of medicine. He needs a counselor. Um, he needs some therapy. It, it can be very good for you, right? Like So go go see somebody, talk to somebody. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. He goes, all of it's pointless. All this has happened before. All of it's going to happen again. It's just over and over and over again. Is there a thing of which it is said, look, this is new. It has already been in the ages that have gone before us. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the later things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom. That's good, right? Seeking wisdom. All that is done under the heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So seeking out wisdom and all the work that's done under heaven, he goes, that's an unhappy job. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, all is chasing after the wind. What is crooked can't be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who are over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and to know folly. I perceive that this also is just chasing after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So here's what Solomon says in his opening stanza of Ecclesiastes. The smarter you are, the worse it is, because now you know that everything is meaningless and everything is pointless. Um, you've, you've heard of like, you know, uh, ignorant bliss, you know, like people are like, oh, I just, I want to be blissfully ignorant or whatever. It, Solomon is basically admitting that that's the case, that the more you understand the world, he goes, the more meaningless it all becomes, because what's the point of it? Because everything happens the same way that it's always happened. Ecclesiastes 2, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So he's done, he's realized everything is meaningless, so now he's going to try to fill himself with all manners of pleasure to see if that satisfies his lack of joy. He goes, I, I test myself with pleasure. I said, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. So he got himself drunk. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay a hold of foolishness. So he thought, I'll try, I'll try being foolish till I might see what good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. Remember that he built the temple of the Lord for seven years and built his own house for another 14. I made gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. You might remember that Solomon had wisdom in all kinds of trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. 
I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I had great possessions. I had herds. I had flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. We know that about Solomon, that he was the richest of all the kings. I gathered for myself silver and gold, the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, concubines, and the delight of the children of man. So Ecclesiastes is probably being written in the latter part of Solomon's life. I became great and I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eye desired, I didn't keep from them. I kept my, I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all of my toil. This was a reward for all my toil. Then I considered, so he's done everything he could think of. I considered all that my hands had done and all the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold, worthless, striving after the wind, there's nothing to be gained by it. So he still feels worthless about all the things he's done. So... I turned to consider wisdom and madness and foolishness. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what's already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom. That, so this sounds like he's turning. This sounds like he's being positive now. I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than there is in foolishness, as there is more gain in light than darkness. Okay, way to go, Solomon. You realize that wisdom is better than foolishness, but not really. Wait. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive the same event happens to all of them. So he goes, it's better to be wise than a fool. But then I realized they all die. So what the heck? And he said, so then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. So why have I been so wise? So he starts off going, I learned that it's better to be wise than a fool. But then it dawned on me, we're all going to die. So why have I tried to be so wise? He goes, it's kind of worthless. It's pointless. I said in my heart that this also is vanity. This is pointless. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have long been forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for everything is vanity, everything is chasing after the wind. So he goes, man, it's pointless. There is no point to it. He's going to say in the later chapters, he's like, hey, what's the point of all the treasure I have? I don't get to pick who I leave it to. And if I do pick who I leave it to, I don't get to pick what they do with it. So he says this in verse 18. I hated all of my toil, which I toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it. Oh, it's right here. I thought it was in a later chapter. Here we go. I hate uh, all my toil in which, see, I knew it was in my head for a reason because we're going to talk about it today. I hate all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I have labored and used my wisdom under the sun. This is worthless. So he goes, look, I've accumulated all this stuff. I'm going to give it to my descendant after me. Is he going to be wise? Is he going to be a fool? Who knows? Here I've done all this hard work and he's going to do who knows what with it. He's like, this is pointless. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who didn't labor for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. What a man has from all the toil and striving of the heart, for, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he labors under the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest and this also is vanity. Can't even find peaceful sleep at night. There is nothing better than a person for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the busyness or the business of gathering and collecting only to give it to one who pleases God. This also is vanity. This is also chasing after the wind. So let's fast forward to the last two chapters of the book. Chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. If a tree falls to the south of the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. I love this line. Um, if if you're this is kind of like the sluggard who's like there's a lion in the streets if you're constantly looking at the clouds you won't sow if you're constantly looking at the clouds you don't reap like if you're there's always an excuse to not do the labor right and then i like what he says here in verse five as you do not know the way that the spirit comes into the bones in the womb of a woman with a child so you do not know the work of god who makes anything we don't know how god knits the bones together and puts the spirit of a person into that that being in in the womb neither do we know how god makes everything 
In the morning sow your seed, in the evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So be diligent. Work in the mornings, work in the evenings. Light is sleep, and it is pleasant to the eyes to see the sun. If a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that all the days of darkness will be many, and all that comes is vanity. So he's going, look, work hard. And you're like, oh, finally he's getting it. He's like, just do it. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord to build you up. And then he goes, but it's all worthless. And you just go, dude, <laughs> like, come on, man. Uh, verse nine, rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away the pain from your body for the youth and the dawn of life are vanity. He goes, he goes, your youth, he goes, it's vain, it's pointless. He goes, all of this is meaningless. And then we get into chapter 12. He says this, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come, before the years draw near by which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light of the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease. So this is talking about age coming on you, right? The keepers of the house tremble, the strong men are bent, the grinders, your teeth, they cease because they are few. <laughs> You've lost your teeth and those who look through the windows are dim. Your eyes are becoming dim. The doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of the bird. So you're waking up early, right? Because you're getting old. All the daughters of song are brought low. You can't hear as well as you used to. They are afraid also of what is high and the terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms. When an almond tree blossoms, it turns white. So the hairs turn white. The grasshopper drags itself along. Uh, so you're dragging your legs along. The desire fails. So the romantic desire is gone because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets. So he goes, he goes, en enjoy it. He goes, enjoy your youth while you can. He goes, because then the evil days are coming when you're old and when you can't do anything anymore. It, Solomon hasn't changed his ways here. He's not feeling better about life. He says, before the silver cord is snapped or the gold bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So talking about death, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Saying the same thing in chapter 12 he was saying in chapter 1. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. But the words of the wise are like goads, or the words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are collected sayings they are given by the shepherd. So a goad, uh, there's a couple of different ways, but a, a goad was like a sharpened stick that you would prod the animals on, like when you're moving them into a gate or something like that. Uh, it, it was something that would prod people. So he says, the words of the wise are like goads. They prod us forward. They are like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. My son, beware of anything beyond this. Beware of anything beyond wisdom. Beware of making many books for there is no end and much study is weariness to the flesh. Remember, he's already said, what's the point of being wise? I shouldn't have been so wise because the wise and the fool die the same. The end of the matter has, after all has been heard has been fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, this makes us think, oh man, Solomon, he really got it at the end. And this is where I said at the beginning, I... I disagree with that. I, I think Solomon's wise, and we know that wisdom comes from God. We know that God gave Solomon wisdom. That was what Solomon prayed for. Solomon prayed that God would give him wisdom. God gave Solomon wisdom, made him wiser than any of the other people. So Solomon has wisdom that has come from God. And he knows that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. He knows that, but Solomon has not done that. He doesn't do that with his life. You might remember from the end of the, of the life of Solomon, no, what Solomon did was he had married 700 wives. Um, he had 300 concubines, or I might have that backwards, 300 wives and 700 concubines, but a thousand wives in total. And, and they served these other gods and he began to build idols and temples for these other false gods. And he began to worship false gods and his heart was not with the Lord. It says that Solomon departed from the Lord, that Solomon didn't continue to love the Lord. And we know that Ecclesiastes is being written at the end of Solomon's life. At the end of his days, Solomon is like, it was all pointless. It was all meaningless. Everything was worthless. I built houses. I built temples. I did all this stuff. I accumulated wealth. Now I'm old and now I have to give my stuff to somebody else. It was all vanity. It was all stupid. It all has no purpose. And he goes, here's the end of the matter after all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for God will judge everything. Solomon 
is about to be judged by God, but I don't know that Solomon has actually changed. When we contrast this, or we parallel this with what it says of Solomon in 2 Kings, Solomon dies, um, Solomon dies an enemy of God's. It, it appears that way, at least from 2 Kings, that Solomon dies with his heart far from the Lord. And so maybe, maybe this is sincere. And he, it, it's a subtle difference. And we might agree, you and I, on everything except for the last two verses. But the general consensus is that at the at the very end, Solomon goes, you know what though? Hey, honor Jesus, honor or honor God. That's the best thing you can do. The problem is for me is that he spent 12 chapters saying, what's the point? All of this is meaningless. I hate it all. It's worthless. And then he ends with, here's the whole thing. Fear God because he's going to judge you. Like, I read this as a little bit more like sarcastic, like just throwing up his hands, like who cares? Um, some people read it as everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Wait a minute. Fear God. That's what I should be doing honor him. Yeah, that's what it, because he'll judge us. And they read it kind of hopeful. I, I just can't, based on what I know about Solomon from 2 Kings, I can't read it as a hopeful thing. Uh, sorry, not 2 Kings, uh, 1 Kings. I, I can't read it as a hopeful thing. Maybe it is. And so we can disagree on that and that's okay. But, uh, but anyway, Solomon is pretty hopeless and pretty depressed here. And if you're having a really rough day, can I just encourage you don't read Ecclesiastes. Save that for another day. Save that for a day that everything is going your way. Don't, don't compound your sadness by reading Ecclesiastes. It's just too much. It is very, very sad. And, and so there's Ecclesiastes. Tomorrow we're going to look at the last writing of Solomon in Song of Solomon, and that will be episode 127. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.